As we get to chapter 8 here in the book of Leviticus, we're going to read about the ordination and the installation uh, of the priests. And you'll remember that back in Exodus, well, maybe you don't remember, but in fact, if you don't, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen for you. But back in Exodus chapter 29, the first part of that verse says, now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And I put a little note there that consecrate means to set apart. So this was something that God had told Moses to do, to set apart the priests to do their ministry. So um, this is here in Leviticus where we actually read about it taking place. And as we talk about this, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that in the New Testament, we are priests. Jesus is our high priest, right? And we are priests of God. And so you need to understand that because there's a lot of interesting connections that God wants to make, connecting the dots for you and I uh, to, to our, even our ministry uh, today. But it begins in chapter 8, verse 1, by saying, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Everybody in Israel was to know that these men had been set aside. Now remember something, all of the Levites, which were the descendants of Levi, in other words, the tribe of Levi, they were all priests. We, that's why we call them the Levitical priests. But Aaron, who was a Levite, and his descendants were the only ones who could be high priests. So only the Arianic priests could take that position of high priest. You might say, what's the difference between the priest and the high priest? Well, the Levitical priests were basically kind of, they took care of the temple. First of all, it was the, the tent of meeting while they were in the wilderness. But later on, much later on, actually, the temple, they took care of things, they they, they made sure everything was where it was supposed to be for the people to come and worship. But only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and take the blood of the sacrifice uh, first for his own sins and then for the sins of Israel once a year. Now, there were other aspects of the job of high priest that came into this, but that was his most important position. And that only happened once a year on the Day of Atonement. So, God wants the entire congregation assembled, and it says in verse 4 that Moses did as the Lord commanded, and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. So, everybody is watching as Moses brings out Aaron and his four sons, and he begins washing them with water. What a strange sight that must have been for everybody just to kind of stand there. And it says, And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastpiece on him. And in the breastpiece, he put the urim, and the Thummim, what in the world are those? The Urim and the Th we don't know very much, actually, about the Urim and the Thummim, except that they were used by the high priest to determine the will of the Lord. How it worked, we don't know. It's never explained to us in the Scriptures, uh, but it was used to discern the voice of God in a particular situation. Verse 9 says, and he set the turban on his head, and on the turban, in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, if you, when you go through the, the book of Exodus and you read how this, all this garment for the high priest was made, you realize that this was incredible. I mean, the craftsmanship, the workmanship that went into this thing, the colors, it was beautiful. It was bright. There were beautiful blues and, and, and other you know, colors that went into it. But it was all meant to set the high priest apart, to show that you know, he was different. He was set apart. And that's what that whole idea of consecration 
is all about. And of course, as priests of God, you and I are also set apart. We talked about that uh, quite a bit last week. And um, God wanted them to know that the work of the high priest was a work that was set apart and with a very unique role among the people of Israel. Verse 10, then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar in all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. All right, anointing oil. Well, anointing oil was used because it symbolically represented the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of an individual who also anoints us for service. So as the oil flows uh, and, and is anointed on these various things, it, it speaks of the work of the Spirit, you know, using these things, using this person uh, for his service. And this picture of Aaron's ordination, and this only happened one time for Aaron. Afterwards, when he passed from the scene, his son would be brought up in the same sort of a way, and he would be anointed in the same way as high priest. But this picture was so powerful for the people of Israel uh, it, it, that it remained an idea in their minds depicting the blessing of the Lord just being poured out upon someone. So, and you know, it's kind of something we've lost. You know, we actually still, we anoint people with oil when we're praying for them for healing uh, in keeping with a passage in the book of James, you know, is, are there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders. They will anoint them with oil and so forth. So, you know, we do it. It's still, it still has a symbolic place uh, in the body of Christ, but we don't do it the way they did it. They would take a flask of oil and pour it over somebody's head. I got to admit, that'd be kind of fun, you know, to kind of do that to somebody. First of all, we're not really into the greasy look, but, you know, that, that was a that pouring of the oil over somebody's head is really a very appropriate picture, though, of just this work of the Spirit that just drenches and, and flows downward from the head downward. In fact, this whole idea of the anointing oil being part of Aaron's ordination made its way many, many, many years later into the Psalms. And for the Israelites was a constant picture of the overflowing blessing of the Lord. There's a three-verse psalm that I want to, I'll just share with you uh, the first couple of verses. Psalm chapter 133, check this out. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. That's the theme, that's the context of the psalm. But look at how they depict it. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, that's Mount Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So you can see how the psalmist uses these various word pictures to describe this blessing, this overflowing blessing. Um, and this is a beautiful picture not just of overflowing blessing, but it's a beautiful picture of the blessing flowing down. I need, to, I need to connect with you on that for just a second because you might not know what I mean by that. Notice how the psalmist even says, you know, and, and they're trying to kind of help you to illustrate it. The oil is poured upon the head, running down upon his beard down upon the collar of his robes, notice that he speaks of that progression of the oil flowing downward. And the oil or the anointing always flows downward. Now, here's the deal. Aaron is the picture of our high priest, who is Jesus Christ. We are, what? The body of Christ, right? As the anointing flows upon our spiritual head, Jesus Christ, it flows down from Him. The blessing always comes from Him to the body as the, as the anointing flows downward. 
That's one of the reasons why everything we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Some people wonder, you know, you get into, you become a Christian or whatever, and it doesn't take you long to figure out, gee, everybody kind of ends their prayer with, you know, in Jesus' name. What's that all about? Well, it's all about that He is our source. He is the source of all that we have, all that we do, all that we are. All the blessing, all the anointing comes from our head. It flows down upon the body of Christ. Now, it's a beautiful picture. But it's also an interesting picture of even an individual home. One of the toughest challenges is to convince dads, who, by the way, are the head, the Bible says, you know, in Ephesians chapter 5, that the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, right? So there's also an overflowing blessing that takes place in the life of a family as that blessing is poured out upon the head of the family and, pour, and, and, and sprinkles down to the family members, the various family members and so forth, the wife and to the children and, and so forth. But that blessing is supposed to flow. That's the way it goes. That's the picture we see in Scripture, right? And, it, you know, it, it's, it's important that we recognize it. it, it I got to tell you something. It bothers me sometimes when a woman comes down for prayer and she, she comes and, you know, she'll come to our prayer team or something or even come up to me on occasion and, you know, say, hey, pastor, would you pray for me? And I'm always happy to do that. But I, I say, where's your husband? Oh, he's back. He's talking to somebody, something or other. Go get him. Go get him. There's a progression here. I am not the spiritual head of that particular married woman. Her husband is. Whether he knows it or not, whether he walks in it or not, God wants to bless that woman as that overflowing blessing comes from the head on down. And, you know, it's like, hey, your husband is, is the spiritual. He should be interceding for you just as Christ intercedes for his body. The Bible says that our head is constantly interceding for his body, the church, constantly praying, right? So it's like, husbands, pray for your wives. And there's, there's something about your prayer, guys, for your wives that trumps mine <laughs> because I am not her spiritual head, you know? Uh, you are, guys. You are her spiritual head. God wants to bless your wife and your family men through you, right? There's a progression. It flows downward. So, you know, cooperate <laughs> with God in the way he wants to do things in terms of the blessing that he wants to, you know, bring. Let's keep going. Verse 13. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them. So now it's, it's the boys. Clothed them with the coats and tied sashes around their waists and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Remember, the sons of Aaron are the only ones who can ascend to the position of high priest. And so they would do uh, upon the passing of their dad uh, with the first oldest son, and on uh, down. Verse 14, Then he brought the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering. And you remember what that's all about, that, that transmission, you know, taking, you know, confessing sins and so forth. Uh, interesting picture. Um, what's really interesting about this is that this is the high priest and his sons who are laying the hand on this animal, who's, which is going to be sacrificed. Now, remember, the high priest is the one who's going to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. He's going to make atonement for all the people. He's going to bring the blood of the sacrifice on behalf of the whole nation of Israel on the Day of Atonement. But before this man goes in to do that, he has to himself be forgiven. All right? So, in other words, you have a sinful man, in this case, ministering to a sinful people or for a sinful people. So the bull is brought, and it says, And he killed it, and Moses took the blood, and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it, and purified the altar, and poured out the blood at the base of the altar, and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails, and the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys with their fat, and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned up, with fire outside the camp 
as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he presented the ram of the burnt offering. So we've done the sin offering, now we're going to do the burnt offering. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it, and Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces and the fat. He washed the entrails and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Remember, the burnt offering was where the entire animal was consumed in the sacrifice, and that signified a complete giving over of oneself to the Lord, okay? Giving over oneself completely uh, to God. Verse 22 says, then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination. Your Bible may say ram of consecration. And this is a special offering just for the ordination service. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram and he killed it. And Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot strange sort of a ceremonial thing, is it not? Well, this was symbolic of, once again, the whole person being given over to the service of to the Lord from, you know, head to toe. You and I would say, you know, he, he, he's completely given over. He's, he's uh, he, you know, his whole heart. But this signifies all of his service, all of his life given over to the work of the Lord. And, and by the way, you'll notice, why is it the right earlobe? Why is it the right thumb? Why is it the right toe? Well, remember something, right was always considered to be the position of strength, okay? Um, it was your first, it was your best. Um, a, a child, a, a son born into your family would be referred to as the son of my right hand. When Jesus is seated after his ascension, the Bible says he was seated at the right hand of the glory and power and majesty of God. And that is the position of power. It's always considered the position of power. It's a symbolic sort of a thing, but that's the way it was. Actually, in the Old Testament days, people who were left-handed were kind of looked at a little oddly because they were very different, you know. But um, we've kind of gotten over that. <clears throat> So there was a great symbolism that went on. And then this is all repeated. Uh, it says in verse 24, Then he presented Aaron's sons. And Moses put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. And then he took the fat and the fat tail and all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and the right thigh, and out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened loaf and one loaf of bread with oil and one wafer and placed them on the pieces of fat and on the right thigh. And he put all these things in the hands of Aaron, in the hands of his sons, and waved them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering. This was an ordination offering. Your Bible, again, may say consecration with a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. And Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments and also on his sons and his son's garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting and there eat it and the bread that is in the basket of ordination offerings as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it and what remains of the flesh and the bread you shall burn up with fire. And you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for it will take seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. 
At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moses. So our ordination of Aaron and his sons is talked about here in Leviticus chapter 8. So we move on to chapter 9. And this, you know, chapter 9 basically covers the beginning of their duties and how they did their duties as they took them up. And then at the end of the chapter, there's a special section of an appearance by the Lord in fire showing that he had approved of these things. And you're going to see how that plays into the following chapter. But here in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, on the eighth day, so now the, the, the consecration period or ordination period is, is finished, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb both a year old without blemish for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people and bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord commanded. So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver for the, from the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. Then he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him, piece by piece, and the head, and, uh, and he burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering, on the altar. Then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering, took a handful of it and burned it on the altar besides the burnt offering on, uh, of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail, that which covers the entrails, and the kidneys in the long lobe of the river, uh, of the liver, they put the, uh, the fat pieces on the breasts, and he burned the fat pieces on the altar. But the breasts and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So understand what has taken place here. This is really after the period of their ordination, the first time that Aaron and his sons go through the whole process of sacrifice. They do everything the Lord told them to do. Then Aaron and Moses go into the tent of meeting. As they emerge, uh, Aaron blesses the people and fire comes out from the altar and burns everything that is on it in the, in the uh, viewing of all the people. This is how the Lord appeared to them. Uh, that day, and it says they shouted and they fell on their faces and everybody was amazed. But whenever God does a powerful work, it is always a possibility 
for those who are involved in that work to begin to take something unto themselves and think that they're kind of something. And that's what we're going to read about here in Leviticus chapter 10. It says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire. Your Bible may say strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And this basically is telling us that the two oldest sons of Aaron decided to approach God completely on their own. There was no specific purpose other than just approaching God. They just decided, you know, they were going to approach God. Well, check out what happens in verse 2. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Now, I want you to stop there, because this is a challenging set of verses for us to kind of look at, because when we look at it, particularly from the perspective of where we live today, it, this kind of assaults our sensibilities here a little bit. We're thinking, now, what in the world? Fire comes out from the altar and literally consumes these men. They die on the spot. What is going on here? Well, we're not told, actually, why these men did this. But regardless, it was a reckless and very foolish thing for these men to engage in. On the surface, you know, what it kind of looks like is just a couple of guys who did nothing more than, I guess, commit a ceremonial misstep. Oops, shouldn't have gone in when we did. Maybe should have waited for dad or something like that. But at the heart of this act, there was a reckless disregard for God's law and his character. There were, I mean, this was wrong on so many levels to begin with. And remember something. These, these men heard the instruction of the Lord as it related to coming before the Lord. And they knew, first of all, these were the wrong people to be handling incense being presented to the Lord. This was something that their dad was supposed to do as high priest. These men who are not the high priest were not to take incense in these censers before the presence of the Lord. That wasn't even supposed to happen. Next, they acted at the wrong time. The only time Aaron was supposed to bring incense before the Lord in just this way was on the Day of Atonement. And it was only Aaron who was supposed to do it. But that was the only day when something like that should have happened. And then we're, we're told that they acted uh, with the wrong instruments since they used their own censors instead of the censor of the high priest. Remember, the, the censor of the high priest had been anointed and prepared and set apart for taking incense into the Holy of Holies. Theirs had not, and they knew that, right? And then finally, they acted under the wrong authority. They didn't talk to Moses. They didn't talk to their dad. They obviously weren't trying to follow the Word of God, which, you know, they had heard Moses give them related to these things, and, and were told that they used the wrong fire as well. You, you know, your Bible says unauthorized or strange fire. Um, you see, the high priest was told to take coals from the brazen altar and use those in his incense censer to take it before the Lord on the Day of Atonement. But see, these men supplied their own fire. So this was an unauthorized entrance and so forth, even with the fire. And it seems to me that basically the, the critical error that these two men made is that they decided that what they wanted and what they believed was just as important as what God had revealed. And that's an important thing for you and I to think about here for just a moment because somehow these men felt like they had the right at this moment to kind of cut and paste their own ideas, their own desires, their own beliefs over the top of what God had shown them and on the agenda that he laid out and so forth. 
And, and I bring that up to you because, quite honestly, it's something that uh, we've seen repeated. It's an error that's been repeated many times since. In fact, what these two men did reminds me a lot of what we see in various parts of Christianity. You know? Um, rather than a, a reverence and a respect for God's Word, a lot of, many churches today have kind of embraced teachings and beliefs that are nowhere found in the pages of Scripture and practices, you know? That's like, where'd you get that? That's not in the Bible. And so you ask the question, well, where'd that come from? If it's not in the Word of God, where did it come from? Well, where else but the example of Nadab and Abihu who basically said, I know, let's do it this way. We kind of know best, you know. We're going to give it a try and so forth and, and paid for their error with their lives. You know, what we've just read here in Leviticus chapter 9 is a, a, a historical event that the nation of Israel has had ever since it happened and was recorded and has been passed down to them. They've had this. The Christian church has had it too, but the nation of Israel has had it for even longer. And, you know, they failed to learn the lesson from it because the lesson is don't just do whatever you think. Don't do whatever you think is right as it relates to God and approaching Him and, and the way we walk with Him on a daily basis. Walk according to to the word. But you know, you look at the history of the Jews, they didn't learn the lesson from Nadab and Abihu. Do you remember when Jesus confronted the, the religious people of his day? Let me put a passage up on the screen for you from Matthew chapter 15. This is uh, verses 7 through 9. It says, Jesus said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. And look at this last sentence. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. People, that's just the example of Nadab and Abihu. Let's try it this way. Let's go this direction. Let's just kind of see what happens. And unfortunately, it's happening in just too many churches. Christian churches today. So let's take a look at this judgment that God brought upon these two men. Look at verse 3 with me here in your Bible. It says, Then Moses said to Aaron, and this is a very important statement, this is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And yet we're told Aaron held his peace. Now, I don't know if you have an NIV on your lap. I kind of like the way the NIV puts this. Let me put this on the screen for you. Here's how the New International Version renders it. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And that is such an important statement. In other words, Moses is basically saying to Aaron, you know, God warned us that you can't just approach him in any reckless or casual manner. You can't just approach God. He's holy. I mean, when you, when you read through the Scriptures, in the Old Testament, you read through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, if there's one thing that you come away with, it's don't approach God. Don't even get close, right? When, when the priests, when they were on the move in the wilderness and the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the rest of the nation of Israel had to keep their distance like 100, 200 yards. It's like, don't even get close to that thing. What is, and, and then, you know, when God was giving them the Ten Commandments, you know that the whole nation of Israel heard the voice of God giving them the Ten Commandments. And they totally freaked out when they heard that voice. But do you remember what God said to Moses repeatedly before he did it? He said, don't let the people 
come up here or they will die. He said, they are not even to touch the side of the mountain lest they die. And Moses was told that repeatedly. Don't come, you know, the message is clear, you guys, in the Old Testament. Don't come near God. Don't come near Him. The only way certain people in the Old Testament could approach God was if they had the right calling and the blood. They had to have the blood. They could only enter in with blood, first for the sins of their own and then for the sins of the people, and, and only once a year. So hopefully the message is loud and clear. Now again, we're talking an Old Testament perspective, aren't we? Don't go near God, whatever you do, okay? It's almost like the writer of Hebrews had this very story here in Leviticus in mind when he wrote something in the 12th chapter of that New Testament letter. Let me put that on the screen for you. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning verse 28, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, because remember, we're priests, with reverence and awe. Look at this last phrase, for our God is a consuming fire. It's interesting, even in the New Testament, it reiterates the fact, our God is a consuming fire, right? <laughs> so important for us to see this. We keep forgetting this. Man cannot approach a holy God. Do you guys remember when, when King David, the, before King David became king, back when Saul was king, you'll remember that the uh, Ark of the Covenant had been stolen from Israel. They took it out to battle, treating it like their lucky charm or their rabbit's foot, and they got pasted by their enemies, and the Ark was stolen, taken away. And uh, eventually, by the grace of God, the ark made its way back to the land of Israel. And it was being kept on kind of the outskirts of the land, really uh, right on the border of Israel by a guy. David heard that this guy was having his socks blessed off. So he basically said, hey, we're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And so he put together this huge parade of people. He got this new ox cart, remember, to put the ark on. And he got the musicians all going and cranked up and started this big celebration of people and so forth and so on. And, and check this out. Let me show you just a couple of the verses from this. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the a threshing floor of Nacon, it says, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled, we're told, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died beside the ark of God. And you'll remember, as you go on and read that story, David was kind of, he was grieved, and he actually got angry. And he said, how in the world can we do this? Well, that's, that's a good question. Now you're answering, you're asking the right questions, David. How in the world can we do this? Actually, it moved David to go back to the Scriptures and find out that, oh, there's a prescribed method for moving the Ark of the Covenant. It's to be the priests on poles, not on an ox cart. And they did it right the second time, but they learned by sacrificing one of David's men because our God is a consuming fire. You know, today we totally take for granted the fact that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we can enter the presence of God whenever and wherever we wish. But we forget. We forget what Jesus had to suffer to gain us access. That He suffered with our sin. He was punished with our iniquity. We forget that He poured out His life unto death so that you and I could waltz into God's presence whenever we want. And that's why we can come into God's presence whenever we want. Remember, the, the, the overwhelming message of the Old Testament is, is you can't come before God. Sorry, you're out of luck, Chuck. You just can't do it. 
God is a consuming fire. Well, guess what? God is still a consuming fire. He hasn't changed. He didn't just decide when the New Testament rolled around, you know what? I've been hard on these people. You know, dropping them dead like flies here and there whenever they touch this, whenever they go there. No, we're not going to do that anymore. I'm going to turn over a new leaf and let them just come on in whenever they want. Nothing like that happened. What took place is Jesus died on the cross horribly, suffered horribly pouring out His blood so that you and I might be robed in His righteousness so that we might enter into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of the throne room of God. That's why we get to come, you guys. But we forget. We forget. Our God is still a consuming fire. He just doesn't consume us because we're clothed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful and beautiful New Testament reality. But look at, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 3. Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness, and look at this, access with confidence through our faith in Him. So do you get to come into God's presence because you're a good person? No. Our access is through faith. Faith in what He did for us on the cross. It's finished. It's done. It's complete. Your sins are covered. They are, they are paid for. And now by faith, we come into the presence of God. And it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. But people don't ever forget what had to happen to gain you that access. Because you have something that the people of Israel never had, at least back at that time, that total access to God anytime. Verse 4, And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near. Carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithmar, his sons, his, so these are his two remaining sons, do not let the hair of your heads hang loose and do not tear your clothes, lest you die and wrath come upon you, or excuse me, come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. In other words, don't mourn or don't show your mourning in the typical ways. Let the rest of the people of Israel do it for you. And so, you know, once again, this is one of those things that you and I read in the Bible and we're kind of like, really, God? Really? Don't let them mourn. Don't let Aaron and his two remaining sons mourn the death of the other two boys. You have to remember something. These men are official representatives of the altar of God. And for them to go through the typical process of mourning during this time, for those who had just violated the altar, would be seen as an opposition to the judgment that God had rendered in this case. And it was a severe judgment. There's no two ways about it. But God had, these men had done these things with full knowledge. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. They knew that they were not to go before the Lord that way. And they violated the specific directives that God had given. He had warned them over and over and over, don't do it, and they did it anyway. And they paid the price. And for Aaron and his remaining surviving sons not to mourn was to show that they understand there's a price, that there's a cost. There are consequences related to violating the revealed Word of God. Furthermore, verse 7, God said to them, And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. 
It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And of course, the whole reason there is to be under the influence of something like strong drink while they're ministering is only going to heighten their possibility of doing something stupid and losing their life for it. You are to distinguish, verse 10, between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithmar, his surviving sons, take the grain offering that is left of the Lord's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it is your due and your son's due from the Lord's food offerings, for so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are given as your due and your son's due from the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the people of Israel. The thigh that is contributed and the breast that is waved, they shall bring with the food offerings of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be yours and your sons with you as a due forever, as the Lord has commanded. Now, the chapter ends with an interesting uh, sort of a commentary here. Now, Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burned up. It was not to be completely burned up. It was to be eaten by the high priest and his sons, at least a portion of it. And he found out that it was completely burned. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithmar, the surviving sons of Aaron, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is a thing most holy and has been given to you that you may bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord? Behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly ought to have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, Behold, today they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offerings before the Lord. And yet such things as these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would the Lord have approved? And when Moses heard it, he approved or he relented. So what's happening here? Aaron is basically communicating that his sons had fulfilled the requirements of taking care of the offerings as they were supposed to be, but because of what had just happened to the two brothers, Nadab and Abihu, they felt that eating the, 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 the special meal before the Lord would just be inappropriate in the midst of their broken hearts. And Aaron simply explained it to his brother. And he said, you know, in light of what has happened to us this day, I just felt like it wasn't appropriate. I could not partake of that with joy and with thanksgiving, and I just couldn't receive it in, in, with the right heart, and I, it just, my heart's just not in it. And uh, when Moses heard that, he, he, he realized that Aaron was trying actually to be reverent instead of irreverent. Isn't that interesting? You know, um, God understands, you know. I mean, even though he told them that they weren't to mourn in the usual way, when they responded with their broken hearts in the midst of the situation, God, God didn't strike them dead, you know. So it, it's an interesting sort of a thing, you know, that we see throughout the course of Scripture. There are times when human need enters into the equation related to the law and things are done which usually are not supposed to be done, but that human need supersedes the law, you'll remember David came at a time, was hungry, went to the high priest, asked if there was anything to eat. And he said, well, only the bread that was on the, on the table of showbread, the, the bread of the presence, it's here, but that's all we have. Well, that was only be eaten by the priests. And yet the priest gave it to David and he handed it to his men. And in that case, the human need superseded the specifics of the law. You know, you remember in, during the time of Jesus, we're told in the book of John that while Jesus was 
in the city, a, a woman was literally cast at his feet. And the people who threw her there uh, explained to Jesus that this woman had been caught in the act of adultery. And they went on to say, Moses says that we're to stone this sort of an individual caught in the act as they were. What do you say? Of course, the whole thing was meant to trap Jesus, right? Because first of all, they weren't, able, they weren't supposed to kill anybody under Roman rule. They didn't have the right to take a life, to be honest with you. And they could get in pretty serious trouble by doing it. Uh, doesn't mean they didn't do it from time to time, but, um, but they weren't supposed to. And if Jesus said, yeah, according to the law, stone such a person, you know, they could just instantly go to the Romans and say, well, he's, no, he's, he's a lawbreaker and no friend of Rome and whatever all else. And if he said, no, don't stone her, then they could basically say, you know, he doesn't care about the law of God. So either way, they figure, we got him. We got him. But you remember the need of the moment superseded. And, and Jesus basically responded by saying, yeah, okay, fine. So, all right, stone her. But let him who is without sin cast that very first stone. The Bible tells us that beginning with the eldest, they began to just drop their stones and, and go away. And Jesus responded to the woman and said, where are your accusers? Where are those who brought you? She said, I, there's nobody here. He said, so no one condemns you, no, and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Again, the law stated that a stoning was required in a situation of that sort of adultery. Remember, it was kind of a trumped up thing anyway because, you know, the woman, if, if the woman was caught in the act of adultery, where was the man? She can't be in the act of adultery on her own. So we know that something weird is going on here to begin with. But second of all, you see mercy triumphs over judgment. And we see it repeatedly in the Word of God. So anyway, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. And we'll pick up where we left off next time. So let me close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for giving us this time tonight in the Word. And as priests of God, as the body of Christ, we thank you for the pictures that we are given here in the book of Leviticus that help us to gain a better understanding of this, this ministry that you've given to us. And Lord, we, we recognize that in the Scriptures, in the Old Testament, that you are seen as a holy, unapproachable God, a consuming fire. Lord, we forget sometimes that you haven't changed, that you are still the holy, unapproachable God that you always have been and always will be. And yet we know tonight that because we have accepted what Jesus did on the cross for us, that through His blood, we now have access into Your presence anytime. Father, please, don't let us take that for granted. Don't let us become casual about approaching a holy God. But may we at the same time indulge quickly and boldly as we come before the throne of grace to come to the one to whom we cry, Abba, Father, and lay our petitions before you and praise your holy name. We thank you for the word that we've been given tonight. May it fill our hearts. We look to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Wednesday. Your faith stretches to the sky.
Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. 